I see all these people flipping out about these cartoon apes. And I'm like, what? What are these apes? Like, what is going on? One of the best things that NFTs have brought to the table is they have made the collecting so accessible to people. All my early collectors are OGs in my mind. But for me, art is like a need. It's not a want. And collecting is just another form of that. I clicked really fast on the people drop and I actually managed to get it for $1. If I've collected your work, I'm holding it with diamond hands. If you're collecting something, it could become hot in two minutes or 200 years. Welcome to the Collector's Call with Particle, where we chat about art with the top collectors and creators in Web3. I'm your host, Scooter, and today our guest is Trevor Jones. Trevor is an OG crypto artist who has been creating crypto-themed art since 2017. His works include many renowned physical and digital pieces, and he is the organizer behind the amazing Castle Party. If you enjoy this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Trevor. Trevor, welcome to The Collector's Call. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining us. So I have planned for our discussion today a bit of a, a chat around your background. You have a, some interesting background to the crypto art space and art in general. Um, wanted to hear a little bit of insights into some of your specific pieces. Uh, certainly, we'd like to hear uh, what's in store for the castle party. And then if there's time, uh, a little bit of your thoughts on collecting as well. Does that sound okay with you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I think, yeah, definitely talk about a little bit about collecting. I think that's uh, important. It's actually something I don't talk about much. And uh, I do talk a lot about the castle party and, and my background. But um, yeah, let's just, let's, we'll just wing it, see what happens. Wonderful. That sounds great. Well, let's dive in with a bit of your background then. You embarked on your artistic journey a bit later in life. What led you down the path to becoming a creator? Um, yeah, good question. It's, uh, I, I was always interested in art. Uh, I, I did well in school, um, but I never planned on being an artist. You know, I, I think I had dreams of being an artist when I was like seven, eight, nine years old. That was the plan. <laughs> and things changed then, you know, going through high school, I took art classes because they were easy, not because I was planning on taking it any further. Um, but then I started traveling around the world. I left when I was 25, 26, backpacking around to Australia and ended up in Scotland uh, a few years later, uh, working restaurants, hotels, kind of management. Um, and basically, uh, you know, hit my early 30s and and hit that crossroads in life. And I thought, like, OK, I, I don't want to spend the rest of life, my life working in restaurants, although it's given me a lot of freedom and opportunity to travel the world and see it. Um, had a bit of a, a, a breakdown, uh, ended up, um, feeling, getting a bit de depressed, uh, a lot of bad decisions that I was making at the time. And I ended up deciding that art was the, the, the choice that I needed to make to find something in my life that had more meaning and, and value, uh, something that would give me, uh, the reason to continue on. And so I did a, a foundation year at a small art school and then applied to art college when I was 33. I did a five-year fine art degree at Edinburgh, so I was split between studying drawing and painting at Edinburgh College of Art and studying history of art at Edinburgh University, and I graduated at the uh, bright young age of 38, so yeah, it was a little bit later in life. Well, I think we're all grateful that uh, that you made the leap into this space thanks to the, the legacy you've created, um, and your interest in the intersection between uh, art and, and technology precedes crypto. Back in, in 2012, you were painting QR codes, and uh, I think your first augmented reality painting started around 2014. Um, what interests you in that in that relationship between art and technology, and what's allowed it to last so long? Yeah, I, I when I graduated in 2008, um, I was painting, uh, I've been painting more abstract work, uh, just trying to get my head around paint, uh, moving paint around, color relationships, um, you know, personal expression, being very pragmatic in that sense to uh, to trying to understand art and painting. My my father was a, a heavy duty mechanic, uh, and although I never got any of that ability, I can't take anything apart and fix it. Uh, I, I can I can take something apart with a few pieces and, and make a sculpture, but I can never get it back working again. But um, 
I think I, there's parts of my dad that I have inside me, the way my brain works and trying to understand a painting. I was interested in like what makes a painting, what makes some people like a, a painting more than others, what, what makes a great painting. And the idea that I could potentially influence that uh, viewer engagement with the artwork was of interest to me. So actually in 2010 was my first solo, commercial solo exhibition at a small gallery here in Edinburgh. And it was titled Synesthesia. So that's an interesting phenomenon between uh, the connection of, well, for this particular one, uh, music um, and, and musical notes with color. And the, the, the idea, the phenomenon has been around for, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, but, I, you know, and, and also with, within the art world as well. So it wasn't new, but I just was interested in how an artist could potentially translate music to a, a visual language of, of color and, and rhythms and, and textures. But I also took uh, MP3 players at that time. I had a, a bunch of them in the gallery and everybody could walk around and listen to the song, each particular song. There was this contemporary Scottish songs I used that inspired each piece. And so it was thinking about how I could add kind of layers to a painting, to a traditional physical painting and and help the viewer kind of bridge that 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 des that journey to understanding it in a different way or or maybe in the way that I saw it. You know, again, it's all subjective. It wasn't a, a scientific experiment or anything, but that got me on to the concept of or the idea of of just of using technology. Uh, and actually it was the next year I discovered QR codes and I was using them more as a way to promote my next 2011 exhibition. And but before the exhibition even opened up, I was looking at these little QR codes as squares that I was putting out on postcards and that kind of thing, business cards, and thinking, like, can I actually paint this QR code and make it work? Uh, so I spent the, the next year with a, a smartphone in one hand and my paintbrush in the other, uh, learning how to paint straight QR codes, and and then built a a website that became an online gallery, a platform where any artist in the world could upload their own artwork, their social media, their website, their anything they wanted, and essentially turn this traditional painting into a a portal to another dimension of of art and and artists. So yeah, I mean that's and then opened up the possibility that with technology that I could turn a traditional painting into something completely different that that people would engage with on different levels and could connect and and find communities through a painting. Um, and I thought it was a, a brilliant idea, and I thought like that was what two thousand and 12, 2011, 12. So, you know, we're talking 10, 11 years ago. And I thought, like, this is brilliant. You know, nobody's doing anything like this. There were some artists who were creating QR code paintings that would maybe lead to a piece of text or a poetry or something like that, or to their own website. But um, nothing that really opened up and, and engaged a, a huge community of, of artists and people around the world. And I thought, like, this is it. I've, I've, I've finally I've cracked the code. There'll be galleries from all around the world wanting to uh, take me on board. And uh, in fact, it was, it was the opposite. The more in, interest I became in technology and this collaboration between art and tech, the less the traditional world was interested in showcasing my work because there just wasn't really any any market for it. So, you know, I just kept on continuing on. So I, I knew, I saw the future of progress and technology wasn't going to go away it was just going to continue to speed up and as as it has and i knew that eventually something would happen you know i didn't know that i didn't know what bitcoin was at that time um it wasn't until 2017 that i started investigating buying bitcoin cryptocurrency but i just knew that there would eventually be something that would happen that would open up a a, a market of people who were interested in what i was interested in new art with uh innovative techno technological spin to it I love the uh, the the role that hearing about the role that technology played in helping people to um, see and experience uh, art in the way that you you wanted them to. It's certainly uh, been the case through the evolution of it. Um, and you just started to touch on on the entry of crypto uh, before NFTs. You created a number of of physical crypto themed pieces. Um, I think some have said that that that's really the origins of crypto art or these physical works that a uh, number of people, including yourself, were creating uh, before NFTs were, were uh, really prominent. And I'd love it if we can hear a little bit about what you think uh, 
how you think crypto art will be viewed over the years to come in terms of those physical pieces, the the really early ones that you were and others were making. It's a, it's a good question. You know, I'm, I'm never one to speculate on the future unless it's related directly to myself and my and my um, investment and in, in my time and and data projects. Um, you know, I, this is not financial advice. I, I Bitcoin is going to continue to grow and develop and and become a a currency as even more than it is right now, rather than just a uh, whether it's a store of value or a speculation or a, or a gamble. But as it grows, the artwork, I believe that kind of orig- originated with it at the beginning, of course, will have continue to have value. Um, but again, you know, you look at the history of art, and there were great artists historically who were very popular at that time in their lifetime and and then you know they either fell from grace for you know trends changed tastes changed flavors changed um you know and and the the value of their work diminished and never came or something happened things you know didn't um progress as one would think so you know i think being early in the space puts me at, a, at, at an advantage, um, puts me in a very fortunate and, and privileged position. But at the same time, I I can't just, you know, stop and, and, and call it a day. You know, I, I, I know that I can have to continue to develop my ideas, develop my my skills, my techniques, my 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 processes, um, keep exploring, keep keep networking, keep collaborating with with great artists and great builders in the space. Um, and and that's what will hold the value in my work. You know, it's not just there's a lot already. You know, I've seen artists, you know, in the NFT space that were here in 2018, 19, especially, and and they're not here anymore. Or even if they are, their work is no longer has any any value that the the buyer or the, the collectors are putting onto it for for whatever reason. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why I could get into, but it's you know it's it's very important that as an artist, you know, if it's trying to maintain a level of um, a level of, of you know, that reputation, uh, it's, it's not easy. And there's always things that you have to be doing and, and thinking about um, and taking risks on, um, you know, just because you're hot one month doesn't mean as you, as everybody knows in the space, there's a lot of artists um, over the last few years are just, disappeared like i said um and so yeah it's it's and I, for, for me i find it's it's challenging and I, but i like that i like that challenge because i'm always thinking you know again maybe that's where my my dad's mechanic brain has uh, into me i want to figure things out. i want to understand things and not just on a a, a mechanical level but on an emotional level on a, a network level on a relationship level and all these things there's a lot of moving parts in this space and in, in, in the art world itself. Um, and I find it very fascinating. So, you know, I, I don't get it right all the time, but uh, I, I definitely am interested in how all these parts fit together. And therefore I base my, my decisions on my future, on my knowledge of, of this, of this space and all the parts that are working together back and forth. Thanks for sharing some of the, the background and your thoughts on that, Trevor. I appreciate it. Um, would love to ask a quick question as well, just before we dive into some specific art pieces. Um, your partner, Violet, uh, is also an active artist in this space. And curious, um, how does being in a relationship with another artist influence your work? <laughs> You're trying to stir up the pot, aren't you, right now? She's, she's in the studio. I'm right next door in the little office space, but she's I'm not sure if she's listening to it or not. Where is, is she there? Uh, I don't see her. Okay, let's talk about her. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's good and bad. I mean, like like anything, um, you know, they're, they're, it's one thing to be able to go to work and, and do your your thing and then come home and get away from it. But the fact that we're both artists, it's, this is us 24 seven, you know, we, we literally live, breathe and, and sleep art and, and creating and, and the space. So trying to find ways to find balance in our, our lives and in our relationship, you know, we have to be very wary of that. Um, and it, it, it's difficult. It's a difficult balance to find. Um, I think because I had been, 
you know, started in my career, um, you know, 20 some odd years ago. Uh, and hers really, although she's been very creative and was painting many years ago, she's really only focused 100% on her art in the last maybe two and a half, three years. But the the improvement that she's made has been e enormous. You know, like that you see the work that she was painting, you know, and her ideas and concepts two or three years ago to now. Um, and that, is, you know, it really inspires me. It also gives me a kick in the ass because I see how how great her painting is becoming. And I'm thinking, like, geez, I, she's going to be better than me pretty soon. So uh, I need to start, start working a little bit harder here, um, you know, and, and paint more. She's very, very good at painting every day. And I think since this this transition in my life happened in the, the crypto space, you know, from kind of 2018 to now, it's turned my my art career into more of a business you know and and i see um martin is here listening and i've got david you know um who helps me with you know as an admin and that kind of thing so right now my my biggest struggle is is trying to balance this this art creation and art business career um you know and and again that's it's it's i never get it right i spend too much time in front of the computer and not uh, in front of a painting, but having Violet here in the studio with me always give me that look. It's like, Trevor, are you painting today? Are you painting today? It's like, yes, yes, dear. Yes, I'm, I'm going to paint today. <laughs> Thanks for sharing those candid thoughts. I, uh, I, I think she'll be um, pleased if she winds up listening later on. It sounds, uh, it sounds like a reasonable approach and a bit of a uh, life balance, also some motivation that's Welcome for uh, anyone who, who's living within this space. Uh, let's dive into some of your specific art pieces. I'd like to start at the beginning in terms of NFTs. Your your first NFT uh, that you launched was ETH Girl, which ignited a bidding war on Super Rare in 2019. Um, it's an engaging work that makes a clear reference to the Ethereum blockchain and features augmented reality. And this was also a collaboration with a lot of money. What led you to release this piece as your inaugural artwork on chain? Yeah, I... Um... So I first, very, very short intro, um, I, I bought Bitcoin and Ethereum back in June of 2017 and fell down that rabbit hole and, and very quickly started to think about, um, I, my previous exhibition in 2016 was um, augmented reality, political portraits around Trump and Clinton and, and world leaders. And I was... Uh, working on another series of painting called The Famous for the Scottish Portrait Awards. But after that, I was like, okay, you know, what's what what's my next um, interest? What's my, the next thing that get me excited about about what I'm going to do with my my my, my next ex exhibition? And very quickly, I realized that crypto was something that that was of interest to me. I just I was consumed with what was going on in the the crypto space the trading space i like i said before many times i was a very bad trader i, I lost all my money quickly within six six months from the and the crash the, the bull run of 2017 the crash of 2018 but by that time i was already fully emotionally and intellectually invested in the concept of a uh, a crypto art exhibition and that played out the, the next year 2018 with uh the exhibition going uh opening up i think it was november or october 2018 um so once that w uh played out and 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 had, it was a great show and and i realized that you know there were actually people around the world who were interested in, in crypto themed artwork um i decided to to really focus on the, my next year and that's i mean for me as as a more traditional artist i've always decided on you know, taking out every year is a, a different a different exhibition, and that's how artists you know usually work. You you work on bits and pieces here and there, and you kind of develop your ideas, and you work on your exhibition, and it, it goes on for year after year after year. So obviously that's changed a lot over the last couple of years in this script in the NFT space. But that's how I thought. So the next year, I was thinking, okay, what can I do that is crypto related, but still connects me with my history of art background, my, my traditional art background, my interest in, in art history, um, and looking at different artists that would uh, kind of join with the everything together. And Picasso was a, a perfect fit because he was a, a, an innovator. He was one of the greatest innovative minds of the 20th century. He was fearless. He was a risk taker. Um, it's somebody who I, I admired. 
And so I decided to create uh, work towards a, a full exhibition of, of Picasso inspired uh, crypto themed artwork. And I didn't know, you know, what was going to be the, the tech side of things. Uh, I was for the example, augmented reality, but uh, I'd had these, this, this entire body of work and then essentially uh, COVID hit and I, uh, Actually, wait a second. Let's try and get my my times mixed up. Uh, that was eight night twenty nineteen. All right, I'm I'm rambling here. But long story short, I had all this work and I didn't really know what was going to do. The the, the exhibition fell through, I think, because of COVID at that time. And I essentially went to a lot of money. I started seeing a lot of artists in the NFT space. You know who I been watching and, and building relationships with from early 20 uh early 2019 and i thought like is this something that i want to get involved with and you know will that work with my art i didn't really get my head around the whole nft thing until probably mid 2019 and that's when i went to a lot and said look you know like can we do some i i don't know what i'm doing here i don't fully understand how this works i don't know how to mint uh, an artwork can you help me and he said absolutely 100 percent, because he was that kind of guy he was just you know the most amazingly giving giving himself as person and we ended up working together on eth girl and the reason why we chose eth girl is i had all this this whole selection of, of artwork that wasn't going to a physical space and exhibition and and so i basically sat down with him and decided to you know how can we create something that makes sense as a digital, as a, an animation that works with this particular, these or these particular pieces, and we came up with Eve Girl. Thanks for sharing that uh, that background to the piece, as well as to um, your your general entry into into crypto and and crypto art itself. Uh, and I appreciate the. Uh... Sorry, sorry, sorry for all the rambling there. I just get on and uh, and, and, and Violet says to me, she's like, she's like Trevor, you got to stop getting saying dates because you know. But for me, everything fits within a, a a framework of of months and years, and and everything kind of in my head works that way. That I, I see things as as time progresses and for me it's very important to kind of establish things how things are uh on, on like a, a calendar basis although probably everybody's listening is just going like oh i've just shut up not one more date not one more date but anyway for me it makes sense in my head when i talk about it like that uh, not at all it, it made perfect sense uh and i loved your your uh dropping in the uh reference to some of the the cubist um exhibition and, and work that you were doing cubist influenced pieces because uh that really shines through in your creations and i think that's part of the the unique element of your work it's uh it's it's quite appealing to to look at and it's a a visible reference point so that's that's great to hear a bit of the background on um i'm going to leap over to uh the bitcoin bull um one of your best known pieces uh which some say kicked off the crypto bull run in 2020 when it sold for more than 50,000 US dollars um this spring it received an offer of uh, five times what it originally sold for. Would you mind sharing some of the background to that piece and, and what you think its significance will be in the long run? Not strictly financially speaking, but just in terms of um, of, of an art piece. Where do you think this now sits within within popular culture? Uh, yeah, again, it's a, it's a good question, um, and, and I'm not one for speculating. It was it just happened whether you know coincidentally that it dropped uh, it was July 24th, I think, and and there was just an enormous amount of of interest around it uh i'd like i said i i, I did my first drop of eth girl with a lot of money i i dropped a few other pieces um before or shortly after that early 2020 on known origin and super rare and uh on open sea but this piece with the the bitcoin bull i was already in talks with with the guys at nifty gateway right at the beginning of the year in fact it was uh it was um tyler winklevoss had a yeah. funny story. He DM'd me Instagram at the end of 2019 after the ETH girl drop and basically said, like, look, you know, I've got uh, something coming up. Be interested in talking to you about an NFT project. Can I introduce you to some people? And because I don't use Instagram at all, I'm really bad at it. I didn't see it for three weeks. So I ghosted Tyler Winklevoss for, for a good three weeks. Um, and then when I got back to it, I finally said, oh, here's a message from Tyler. That's really weird. It can't be him. And so, what is him? He's got a blue check. And uh, I DM'd immediately and said, like, I'm really sorry for the delay. 
But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, in hearing what you have to say. Uh, please can you email me instead because I really don't check my Instagram at all. Funnily enough, uh, about three weeks later, I checked my Instagram and there's another message from saying like, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, let's get, get this sorted out. He never emailed me. Long story short, we finally did get connected with the Nifty Gateway. They were just opening up the time. And that's when I decided to start thinking about how, what my, my big drop, there was a, a lot of excitement around Nifty Gateway. And I knew that I wanted to create something that was really special and I needed to put a lot of time. So it was almost a six month project working on this one artwork, this one painting everything that went with it. It's a huge, huge painting, uh, oil on canvas with sand, um, ripped up Bitcoin, uh, white paper, uh, microcrystalline wax. Uh, and and then, of course, all the, the animation with the gold, silver, bronze editions. And even that itself was something new. The, the, the gold, silver, bronze edition, along with the one one was something that never happened in the NFT space before. And they kicked off a lot of the very variants of that over the years. Um, so I, I, I like seeing, you know, all these different things that happen in, in the early days and then how it influences the, the crypto art and the NFT scene over the, as the years go on. Um, but yeah, so, so it's just, what, what's it going to hold in, in this space or what's it going to say? I think it's, it's embedded in to the history, um, the mythology of the space, even the fact that, that Beeple's Genesis drop. Uh, was inspired by in, his his politics, his bullshit piece was inspired by the Bitcoin bull. He he actually emailed me shortly after the drop of the Bitcoin bull. I didn't know who he was. Uh, he, some guy called Mike Winkleman, get, I get an email from him. And he says, hey, you know, hey, Trev, congrats on your, your big drop, you know, fantastic success. I'm going to be doing a drop next month on Nifty Gateway. You know, it'd be great if we can catch up, you know, give me a phone call or whatever. Here's my number. And I had no idea who he was, so uh, I just sent him an email back and they're like, you know, uh, good job, Mike. You know, congrats on your upcoming drop. Um, all the best, but I'm a bit busy at the moment, so I posted him. And uh, it wasn't until about like two months later that I, I found out who he was and, and <laughs> immediately emailed him and said, like, dude, super sorry. <laughs> let's 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 catch up. But uh, we had a laugh about that. Um, so again, you know, all these things happened, uh, and it kind of positions that particular piece in a very unique way in the space because it was such an important artwork in 2020. And for that reason, you know, I think it will always have a, a lot of value um, with it. But again, you know, I, I know that Pablo who owns it, I think he's put like a 55 million price tag on it. Um, not that long ago, somebody put an offer in for 250,000, which is pretty impressive in a crap market they were in, but it's something that, that there was a 250,000 quarter of a million bid on the secondary sale, but there, there was no exchange happening. I, I do think that Pablo believes so much in that particular piece that he's going to hold on to it for a very long time. It's wonderful to hear those stories uh, and some of the personal exchanges that happen in the background to this piece. And and yes, I, I agree. It's, it's It seems like one that will uh, really resonate within this space and, and captures a lot of the the sentiments related to crypto. Um, kudos to you for having having launched uh, some of those discussions. And I think I'll continue that on into question around um, perhaps your best known work, the Bitcoin Angel. Uh, it's originally a one of one, uh, but is very popular, I think, thanks to a, a successful open edition that you released. Um, there's a cautionary tale behind it that I'm not sure everyone's familiar with. Could you tell us a bit about what this piece represents? Yeah, so in when I first started working on this series of crypto themed oil paintings, um, it was me as a as a noob uh, who had uh, put a, my life savings, which was a very small amount of money, a few thousand at that time in 2017, into crypto, uh, twenty times it, and then lost it all, um, you know, very quickly in 2018 in the crash. I didn't know what I was doing, but I had this. I was on this emotional roller coaster as many people are when they initially get into the, the crypto space and the MC space. And, and, you know, there were many, many sleepless nights when things started to go wrong. Uh, you know, the, the, the days of that weren't too much before that previously thinking like, Holy crap, you know, I can, I don't need to worry about making money with my, my painting. I can just paint for fun. I'm going to live a, uh, you know, a wonderful life. As a crypto trader, uh, I found out very quickly that uh, that that doesn't happen. 
as easy as I thought it would. Um, so yeah, so I, during that journey of the the year working or ten months working towards these a series of paintings, each one represented a different part of my experience um, and my journey in the crypto space. And the Bitcoin Angel, I was looking for a an image. I was thinking, I, I, I'm I want to paint something that that captures uh, the highs and lows of this crypto adventure. Um, you know, the the ecstasy and the agony. And you know, you don't have to go much further than the the Baroque period, where you had all these phenomenal paintings and sculptures and and architecture that that represents the 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 absolute kind of pinnacle of ostentatious, over the top mentality, and and then you've got Bernini's um, the Bernini's um, Saint Teresa, uh, the Ecstasy of Saint Teresa, and that for me, as soon as I saw that, I just thought like this is something it's it just grabs you emotionally. You know that ecstasy uh, that I felt well <laughs> when the money was rolling in and the, every trade was you know of making money on it, and uh, and then there was the the agony afterwards, and so putting you know keeping it very simple, you have the the sculpture itself, the statue uh, in Rome, and putting the, the Bitcoin behind, and these kind of golden rays coming down uh, that in a in a in a basically in a nutshell. You see it, and depending on where you are in your journey uh, in that space, it can mean different things. But it could be all the the wonderful champagne and and Lambos period that you're in, or it could represent uh, you know, the the horror of of everything that you've just lost in a very short amount of time. Uh, and I thought, you know, that that painting, I had no idea. Of course, you know, it was just one of the twelve paintings that ended up in the exhibition, but. Uh, for whatever reason, it became something that just captured the imagination of the people in this space. I think, you know, what I was trying to say, it it did come through and and people really, really got it. So the fact that it became an open edition uh, at the beginning of 2021 and did as well as it did, it is because of that message that people get when they see it. The ecstasy and the agony is a great summary for that piece and, and certainly for a lot of the experiences within this space, which uh, most have, have felt both poles of. So thanks for expounding a little bit on that. Um, I'm going to squeeze in a question from uh, Harold Atan here. Uh, Harold uh, wrote as a reply to our space, curious to know what happens to the physicals of works such as the architect. Are they kept as records? Are they for sale? What do you see as the creative value or economic value that uh, those pieces have as a physical counterpart, but have their first um, actual sale on chain? Can you speak a little bit to that question? Can you can you explain a bit more? I mean, yeah, the the as you talking about the architect Satoshi, which was painted in 2018 and sold at the exhibition, and then became a an NFT uh, in 2020. Is is that what you mean? Yeah, I think the the relationship between um, those works that you have both sort of physical versions of, and then also uh, digital versions of. How do you see that relationship playing out? And uh, and yeah, where it is are both versions of those valuable? I think that's a question that some folks have in this space. Yeah, again, that's that's a, a very good question, um, and I know there's been a lot of discussion and debates over the last few years around that. Um, and gosh, you know, for me personally, I see and this is actually where, where my wife and I completely disagree. She's on the opposite side. I see the physical and the digital as two separate artworks. Now, if somebody um, buys the, if let's say, for example, often now, if I sell a one-on-one digital, that the, the, the buyer of that one-on-one digital, the NFT, will also receive the physical. But there's been numerous times in the last few years where the physical was already sold, sold even before I'd, I'd heard about NFTs. And then... I digitized, it was already digitized, high-res image, and it became a, an NFT, or I created some kind of animation from the original artwork, and that became an NFT. Each one is different. You know, each each um, each kind of artwork I personally see is a different a different entity. It, it means something different. Um, just like, a, you know, you have a, a physical painting, and you make a series of limited edition prints from it. They they're they're two separate works of art. Um, the one on one physical, of course, will be more valuable. It's the original, but the print reproductions 
uh, are limited edition signed. Those are also separate, unique individual works of art um, that are price pointed in such a way that somebody who maybe not can, can afford the physical one of one can afford uh, a, a print of it. Just like you know, with you guys at the Particle, you fractionalize the artwork, which enables more people to have access to owning a, a high end. Um, artwork and and I think as artists throughout history, um, that's what we've been able to do is to be able to to not only monetize the the, the original piece but through etchings or screen prints or t-shirts, you know, whatever it is, to find ways to um, to continue to add uh, a value to variations or variants. And the digital, the NFT, is another way of, of doing that that's that's what i see but again you know if for me now i i for example you know with um the bitcoin bowl i know that that there there was there has been discussions about the fact you know which one's worth more um should they should i have sold or should the the owner of the pablo um who when he got the one one nft should if he had the access to the painting you know the, all these things that happened um it was it was chaos for me i you know i didn't know what was going on uh i i was trying to make decisions that i thought were the, the best um you know the right thing to do uh you know and and so you learn as you go and and now it's you know every single time this comes up it's if it's it's very difficult being a physical artist a traditional physical artist in the space um rather than just a a, a digital artist who is only selling digital work because you will always have that the issue of what's happening with the physical, what's happening with the digital, and also what happened, you know, can you can you bring the two together? What happens if I've had uh, artworks where I've sold the NFT um, and I've, I've then sent the owner of that NFT, the original painting, and then that that individual collector sells the NFT for a profit and he keeps the physical, you know, and how do I feel about that? Say, like, well, I mean, it is what it is. It's his his artwork. Um, you know, it's it's a bit cheeky. You know, he actually made profit, and he still owns the physical artwork. So this is a it is a, the the wild west. It's a it's a new frontier. And as artists and collectors, we're all trying to figure out um, which how to navigate through it and to do the right thing. And I think the most important thing is you have to do your best to do the right thing. If you're in it entirely to to pull the rug um only bad things are going to happen it's going to be bad for your reputation so it's trying to have and having these conversations having the conversations with collectors you know i think that's what I, my most important thing that i've learned so far over the last few years is that talk to the collectors um and again every, collectors are different you're going to get different answers um each collector has different expectations but as long as you talk to the collectors um you can get a better understanding of, of what decision you, you make going forward. Thanks so much for sharing uh, those thoughts. And with your uh, experience creating uh, many physical and, and uh, NFT pieces, I think your insights are, are as good as anyone's on this topic. So really appreciate you sharing that, Trevor. Um, you just mentioned collecting. So let's turn to a few questions related to collecting. Uh, you uh, provide a lot of benefits for collectors, um, particularly through the Bitcoin Angel, uh, but you're also your other pieces. And, and you've managed to, as you were just referencing, uh, grow that pie to allow more people um, access to participate in, in, in collecting some of your works. Could you tell us a bit about how you use uh, benefits to engage with collectors who support you on your artistic journey? Um, yeah, I, well, first off, the, the Bitcoin Angel is a good example. Um, but since then, there's been other works of mine that uh, there was uh, the Ascension. So people who own more than one Bitcoin angel could ascend theirs and, and receive a gold, silver, bronze um, standard angel. Each one carries different levels of, of benefit that range from a uh, percentage off of my, my future, any work that's coming up, uh, physical or digital, depending up to 10% uh, discount access to the castle party the first one um you know uh first dibs on on new drops or or uh, new physical limited edition prints that i'm sending out so uh access to, to to new information first before anybody else gets it and again that's just 
it makes sense. You know, there's there are a lot of conversations about the, the pros and cons of of utility as an artist. You know, like utility. This is my utility. This is my artwork, and, and accept it for what it is. And and that's that's all great. But every artist is different as well. And for me, the 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 notion of of utility was one more thing that I was interested in. I thought like, okay, this is unique. This is a, an interesting way to um, to develop my 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 art career, my my collectors, my network, and it does bring on more more work, more challenge, more thought processes. But it it was just something that intrigued me and inspired me. Um, and it's not it's definitely not for every artist because it does bring in a lot more confusion and and work and and hassles and issues and it's impossible to make everybody happy. You know, I found out very quickly that when 4,158 Bitcoin angels were sold and I've got this enormous network of, of collectors, some who'd bought one, some who'd bought 50 or hundred that trying to make everybody happy is going to leave you sleepless for months. So uh, again, I had to learn as I went, what is the, the right thing to do um, the right thing to do for the collectors and the right thing to do for me and trying to find this, this balance between them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, essentially it in a nutshell with regards to creating artwork that has utility. Um, it's a, uh, it's a double-edged sword and you, I think the most important thing is that you, you have the integrity to follow through with what you're going to do. For example, uh, the castle party is a, a, a good one. You know, it's, it's, by far the, the 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 worst financial decision for me in the last few years. Um, it takes up an enormous amount of my time, so I'm not painting, and my wife yells at me, which isn't good. But because <laughs> because of that, um, but it's 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 something that I'm super excited about. You know, to be able to do something like this, I never thought in a million million years that I could have done had a castle party and people from around the world collectors would fly in and 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 bring in great DJs and and have parties and and entertainment um you know it's it's something that that I that keeps me up at night excited and nervous and scared and and I love it it's, it's just part of of life you know I could have taken the the easy way out and not offered anything at all just continue to make art you know as other people, most other artists do, and and that would have been probably the the smart thing to do, and the most financially beneficial beneficial thing to do. But for me, it, I want to keep on challenging myself. I want to keep on experiencing life. Um, and 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 this gave me an opportunity to do something completely crazy. Um, and you know, I have no regrets. You know, there's there's no regrets. You know, I have to continue to look at how the decisions that I make going forward. Um, and how that's going to fit within the current market that we're in right now. But at the end of the day, when I say I'm going to do something, I, I follow through with it. And if that means putting on a castle party, and, uh, and then that's what I'm going to do. And it, it's crazy. But uh, yeah, it's it's also such a, a, an honor and a privilege and a blessing to be able to, to do some of that and bring in now most of these collectors are, are my friends. And to be able to have that opportunity to bring in people and and have a party in France um, and and spend time together that's that's what's really important to me and that's I think what I've learned mostly over the last few years and it comes with the 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 benefit of of making some some you know some good sales in in 2020 2021 that the financials um, put me in a position where I can do something like this and and that it you know it's it's kind of what can I do to to give back, what can I do to to? It's, it's not just about making art and selling for me anymore. It's about part. It's about the community. It's about what can I offer? Um, you know, put on the exhibition, the a lot of money charity exhibition, raising money for charity, uh, looking at um, uplifting, you know, new artists, established artists, um, you know, all these different things that have changed from 2018 to 19 to, to now. Uh, again, I'm just rambling. I'm just basically telling you my my, my last four years in in 30 seconds. But uh, yeah, it's it's life is good. Life is exciting. It's 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 amazing position to be in. Um, it's highly stressful, uh, and and yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world.
Thanks so much for that response. I, I think the the castle party is the best uh, answer to the when utility question in the space that has ever come up. And we'll we'll dive into a little bit more detail in that in just a moment. I have a couple more questions on collecting. Um, one specific to you and your own practices. Um, what types of artwork are you personally drawn to? And does your own collection have a theme? Yeah, that's actually a, a really good question. And I think as a collector, um, as an artist collector, it's I'm it's it's very different for me. I I really don't collect um for investment purposes. Um you know, I I look at all the all, all the artworks in my collection and it's mostly art from people I, I like, people of friends of mine, artists, you know, people who I've met uh, at IRL conferences and and I, and I got to know them. I got to talk about their art. Um you know, if I, I always say if I was smart, I'd buy two or three pieces, like a auditions, two or three pieces, and be able to hold one and, and sell two at some point in the future or, or whatever. But again, it's for me, it's it's never been about selling or buying to to sell. Um, you know, I sold, I think I've sold maybe four, three or four of my NFTs since since I started collecting, and uh, I I made great great profit they sold in 2021 and 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 you know it was it was uh, enormous enormous uh, amounts of, of money especially for the one of one hacky towel but i regret all of them you know i all of those artworks um are are meaningful to me for for some reason or another and you know i'm looking at those ones i just posted uh, a few minutes ago with uh kid icarus aki satoshi verse a lot of money and and saint mg there's just four of of I'm not sure how many got over a thousand NFTs, but they each one has a story. Um, each one means something different to me. But I think underlying, you see, you know, what what underlying underlines my my entire collection, it's it's probably friendship. It really is, you know, support. And I think also uh, a a lot of up and coming artists who I've supported. It's knowing you know my background that. The reason I was able to continue on with my art career for 2000, from 2008 to 2018, 10 years, was because a, a few people who bought my work, bought my paintings, and, and whether they believed in me or they were friends and they just knew that I was struggling financially and wanted to help put some food on my table, um, you know, it was because of them that I was able to continue my art journey and get to where I am now. So I understand the value of, of being a patron of the arts because you're able to see and find artists that you, that you like as people. Um, if they're talented, even better. But for me, it's, it's knowing from my background that every time I buy a piece of work from an artist that gives them a lifeline to continue build, building and, and making more art. So really for you know, look at my collection, and I'd say 90% of it is work by artists who I just liked and I wanted to buy their work and hopefully they will continue to create more work. That's a very refreshing uh, approach to, to hear. Thanks for sharing that. Um, are there any experiences or, or interactions with your own collectors that really stand out to you? Meeting them in real life. Absolutely. Um, they're, I see Basilius or Basileus, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, he's amazing. I love him to pieces. He's again, he's one of these people in the space who um, it's about, it's really about supporting artists uh, and, and being a part of something new and exciting. And that's refreshing. Um, Motorats is probably my, well, he was the, my first collector as an NFT. He bought uh, East Girl. He also, but the second painting in my 2018 exhibition, uh, Crypto Disruption, so the, the physical paintings, he bought the hodler, and that was before the exhibition even opened up. Uh, so I've had a, a relationship with him since, you know, early, well, mid-2018. mid, mid And, you know, since then, um, you know, he's bought a lot of work from Violets. Uh, we have, we've had enormous amounts of, of conversations, DMs, and emails over the years, and somebody we've not met in person, but uh, definitely, you know, we keep on promising we're, we're going to meet at some point. Uh, because I, though, I, I say those two, especially Basileus and, and Motorats, have really changed artists' lives. And it wasn't about 
um, you know, just buying and flipping. Um, flippers are are good too. They're they're a necessary part of the ecosystem. But you look at those two collectors, for, from my perspective and my experience, and they have literally changed the lives of, of thousands of artists, and and that's amazing. And it's just getting to know them, um, and hopefully, you know, eventually meet uh, Motorats in person. I can't I can't wait. That's yeah. Those are two very very special people. A great shout out to two significant collectors in this space who I think helped to redefine what. Uh what collecting should mean and, and set a bit of a, a standard for others to follow. Um, I'd like to turn back with our remaining time to the Castle Party, which you've already referenced. Uh, this September, you're hosting the second annual Castle Party in Paris. Um, what do you have planned for this event and what inspired you to, to create this annual gathering? It was um, said it many times before. It was after the, uh, literally two or three days after the, the Bitcoin Angel Open Edition drop and Violet and I were, literally freaking out like what the fuck just happened to our lives uh, and one of my collectors messaged and he said like now you're gonna have to have a castle party and i just i, I laughed i said like that's hilarious uh-huh and then, but by literally this is how my, my brain works like the next day i'm going like i could have a castle party that's that's you know that's a way again utility you know, have a castle party for the bitcoin angel holders and it just grew, grew from there you know but then you have an idea and it 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 just grows legs and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, which uh, is, is fun but dangerous as well. And so this year it's going to be in France. Last year it was we had a, a, a pre party at another place here in Edinburgh, and then we had a kind of post party at a hotel near the the castle at Stirling Castle in, in Stirling uh, the next day. But the party itself was literally five hours long, six hours, because that's how long we actually had the castle for. It was open to the public during the day, and we, we had to be out by midnight. You know, we couldn't get in until about six o'clock. So when I was speaking with Martin, um, we decided we needed to find a place, a castle that we could have for three days, you know, or at least like, you know, two nights and, and the days surrounding it. And so we looked and looked and looked and researched different castles, different countries all around the world, and eventually found the the chateau this 16th century beautiful chateau in uh, about an hour south of, of paris and we went and we we visited we flew out there we we looked at a couple different places and this place just immediately you know we connected with it but like, this is we could just imagine it's a perfect place for a party of a couple hundred friends um there's a pool there's a we can have a dj in here we can have a dj at the pool party we can have bars around we can have different games and um here's a football field or a soccer field um you know there's just a it's it's just a, a very very cool place to to have a great party and that's how we ended up with this one here in france castle party 2023 it it looks like an amazing venue. Uh, it's giving me an incredible amount of FOMO, maybe more than anything else in the crypto space has to ex- understand that people will be enjoying that beautiful multi-day celebration and some of us won't be there, but I hope it's incredible. Uh, there are still tickets available as well. I've posted a, or pinned a, a tweet here that references how folks can gather those. Um, you also uh, referenced that this event includes a charity exhibit and auction. That's in honor of a lot of money who passed away in March of 2022. You had a very close relationship with a lot of money. What did his friendship mean to you? Yeah, he was just uh, he was just a, a very funny guy, and we had you know constantly chatting in, in DMs, and we obviously did a a, a number of collaborations together and we worked on um not just Eve Girl but then Eve Boy and there was chapters. Uh he was actually working with me on, on chapter two when he was in the hospital and he couldn't continue on anymore. So it was heartbreaking to have built up such a, a close relationship with somebody in such a short amount of time and then to lose him um before we could actually even meet IRL. He was already planned to come to the Castle Party uh in last year in Sterling, you know, he was booked, ready to go. Um, he was looking at flights and and then obviously he couldn't couldn't make it. He was in the hospital and 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 that was, you know, how things ended. And it was yeah, it was heartbreaking. Um, which is the reason why, you know, once when he passed away and in March and the cast party was coming up uh in July, I knew that I, I wanted to do something that would that would help continue his legacy 
um, that would also give back uh, in such a way that, you know, it, there was a, we talked a lot about all the all the, the hilariousness in this, this space and all the, the crap as well. And, you know, the, the conversations we had were, were over the top funny and we saw all the, all the, all the good and, and all the bad. And I knew that, you know, he was the kind of guy who brought light to the space. And I say it many times and all the people he interact with, he, he was literally, you know, friends with everybody. He was the kind of guy who worked with everybody and, 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 and was always there for a laugh and a joke and saying the most inappropriate things. And, Therefore, when he passed away, having a, a charity exhibition, they would continue his legacy and, I guess, be that kind of beacon of, of light for people who didn't know him or coming into the space and to see that there were and are people who kind of built this up and and, and are, are very, very special. And the, the ethos that they have and they, they brought to the space continues on through them. And therefore, it's important for us, you know, who who knew people like a lot of, you know, and to continue on in this space, you know, shining a, a light on them and and bringing that that uh, that seeing a lot of to everybody else and to show that like there's a lot of good stuff that happens. There's a lot of great people in the space, and there's a lot of great things that come out of it. And be able to give back, um, not just to you know uplifting other artists, you know, and helping them connect with collectors, but also to bring up the charitable aspect of it. Um, you know, and the fact that Maggie's charity here in Edinburgh, actually there's 26 locations around the UK and two, uh, worldwide, uh, does such great work. I've known the, them for for about 12 years now, and they, they're such an amazing charity that supports people living with, with cancer, but also their friends and family. So it's just an open space, beautiful architecture, buildings with filled with art. Um, and and what they do is really really invaluable um, service to to the community, and to be able to have an exhibition and and to raise money to support them, it's you know it's it's a win win for everybody. Um, and I know that a lot of would is smiling down uh, or up wherever he is, and uh, and very happy with everything that's that's that we're doing in his name. It's it's yeah. I mean. I just get emotional thinking about him and thinking about what we're able to do in his in his honor. I'm I'm sorry for the the loss of your friend and, and close collaborator, and I certainly think what you're doing through the castle party and the the charity auction and and through your regular reminiscences on uh, on Twitter bring a lot of honor to that memory. So I think we all appreciate that, and thank you for continuing to to celebrate him in this way. Um, Again, lots of info on, on how folks can attend the Castle Party. Uh, I think on your pin tweets, some of our pin tweets here in this space. Uh, Trevor, I know we've taken up quite a bit of your time, and I thank you for being so generous with it. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience about your art, your approach to collecting, or any other topic before we wind down here? Oh, yeah, I was taken off guard. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, look, we're in a shitty market right now. Um, Bitcoin and ETH and, and it's just is dropping even more. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned over the years in the space is that um, you know you have to find some kind of balance and you look for the good. And you know there's like you said a lot of bad things happen. Um, there's a lot of shit that happens, but at the same time there's so many good people. You know and I've uh, I met Harold. You know in NFC Lisbon. Uh, great guy. I love what what you guys are doing at Particle. Um, I think I've had these conversations many times, especially over the last year, year and a half since uh, the bear markets come in. Is that there are people, there's organizations, there's individuals in this space who are are hardworking, wonderful, um, creative, talented, and 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 do the right thing and do good things. And you know this this the space can can eat you up and spit you out if you're not careful. But if you connect yourself with the the really quality people in the space, the people that are in it for the right reasons, who uh, are solid individuals, who, who do good things um, and support the people, um, you know, we, we get out of this the, the most valuable things that, you know, in, in the world, which is, is good times with friends. And, you know, so, you know, I could go on about, art and and collecting and castle parties but at the end of the day really the most important thing that i've got out of this whole space is is 
amazing friendships, you know, all, so many quality, quality people. Um, and being able to meet up with them in real life is for me is, is everything to me. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's me rambling again about, uh, about what's, what's going on in my life and, and why I'm here. But, uh, anyway, thanks for giving me a platform, uh, for, for rambling, but hopefully everybody here and I appreciate everybody who also here who's, who's listening in. Um, hopefully you've gotten something out of it, but, uh, yeah, it's just great to, to be a part of all of this. Oh, thank you so much for your time, Trevor. You've given us many insights today. And and thank you for um, your, your commitment to and support for crypto art generally. You've really helped to transform it into a serious medium for both artists and collectors. And the work you're doing hosting events like the Castle Party creates a place for community to converge and share our passions and aspirations and thoughts about the future. Um, so much gratitude to you for joining us today to share your story. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me again. And uh, have a great weekend. It's Friday, isn't it? Happy Friday, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. And thanks to those who joined us today. Absolutely. All right. Have a good weekend, guys. Cheers. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget to join us at our next collector's call.